Hello, everybody. Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first lightning talk session of DevCon 15. We've got six frightfully exciting speakers for you today, starting with Gareth Randall talking about triplex, which is encrypted backups with no keys or passwords. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. This is a uh, talk about a project that uh, I've created uh, called Triplex, um, which is to deal with a problem that we have with off-site backups. Um, that's the sort of backup if your computer's stolen uh, or your house burns down and basically you've lost uh, everything except the backup. Now, typically, people do that by um, writing their data onto one storage device, uh, taking it uh, to uh, a distant location and hiding it. Um, but uh, there's a problem. Now, it looks like the graphic's not coming out here. Um, I'm just going to see if they've got it. Stop the timer. <laughs> Come on, maximize that. Right, the uh, problem with uh, sending, a, of course, uh, an offsite backup is how you're going to encrypt it. Now, you could encrypt it with uh, a private key, um, but then, of course, there's the issue of, well, how do you actually um, keep the private key safe? The private key may be the thing you're actually trying to restore. Um, you could encrypt with a password, um, but you might forget it. Now, you might say, oh, well, hey, that, that's not very likely. Um, but consider the example in the financial services industry where you have to store data for seven years or maybe more. You could have, say, the police come to your organization and say, we're trying to investigate a financial fraud. Can you restore data from years ago? And it turns out the people who created that backup left the company, so you don't actually know where uh, the actual keys are. Um, Okay, let's look at this project. This is a, uh, a simple, uh, a simplified solution. We have some plain text here, uh, which can be any size, and we have a random byte stream, which is the same length. And we basically just the exclusive or in that together, um, and storing this and the random data on two separate um, volumes. So you're now, uh, to, to decrypt that, of course, you, take the, you bring the two together, uh, exclusive all of them again, you get back your, your original data. So the secret you're now encrypting with is effectively the location of these two hidden uh, storage volumes. So there is a problem, though. Uh, if you lose one, or if one becomes uh, damaged without your knowledge, the other one... Um, silently becomes useless as well. Can we solve that? And fortunately, we can. We can write three volumes, um, each with um, t any two of which can be brought together to restore the data, but any one of which on its own is useless to an attacker. So, how does this work? Right, our three volumes here. Uh, I've used a floppy disk logo, which is almost a bit like security by obscurity, but these could be uh, anything. These could be uh, USB memory sticks. These could even be tapes. Um, they're actually written in stripes, like uh, RAIDs. Um, and you can see here that whenever you exclusive or something, again, you get back the original data. So you can um, exclusive or D1, X or A with A to get back D1. You can exclusive or those two to get back D2, concatenate them, and you've got your data. I'll leave it as an exercise to work out how you get uh, um, the data from the third one and any of the other two. So we have uh, the, uh, there's a cost. It costs uh, three bytes of um, storage for every byte of plain text. The great advantage is that you are now encrypting with a one-time pad. Thank you very much. Um, now, if, and of course only if, your random sources are truly random, then any possible decrypt is equally likely. So, dare I say it, it's effectively unbreakable. So, let's look at the actual project. Um, it's written in Java. The, you, you're basically doing your, your tar, piping to standard in, writing to your three uh, volumes which you've plugged in. When you want to restore, you run the program, and you've, uh, you, you pick any two. Heavily unit tested. Um, 
because the outputs obviously look very random. You can't tell them by eye whether they're right or wrong. Um, I would hope that this becomes more mainstream, and uh, I'm very thankful to DebConf for giving me the chance to make that happen, and thank you for listening. Perfectly timed with four seconds to go. Next up is Tomasz Buchert talking about implementing Debian with Ethereum. Okay. Uh, Ready? I don't know. Okay, I am. Um, it is. This already started. Okay, so I want to I want to share my excitement with something that I recently tried. Anybody tried Ethereum yourself? Okay, one guy. So it's cool, probably. You think also? Yeah. It's cool? Okay. So we, we want to share our excitement with it. So Ethereum is a bit like, uh, a bit like Bitcoin. You, everybody knows about Bitcoin. But it's like, uh, Ethereum is like Turing machine, well, Turing uh, complete machine compared to Abacus, right? Uh, because with Ethereum, you can, you, you can do much more. You can execute, this in a distributed manner, arbitrary programs. Okay? It's actually quite difficult to understand what it means and so on. But I will try to introduce it very fast. So some basic facts. facts. It was initially described two years ago. And there were many iterations uh, already. They are improving the protocol and so on and so on. Uh, Frontier is, is a, the recent re release two weeks ago, which they made, which people could start mine the blocks necessary for computations on Ethereum blockchain. And in some sense, it started really working. Uh, so instead of Bitcoins, you have Ether. There's, there's the same principle. The hash functions are a bit different, and so on and so on. Uh, and there was an in initial presale from Bitcoin, which I didn't participate in. I mined some blocks using Amazon GPUs, just for fun. Uh, and so internally, what's happening? There is a bytecode that is run on a virtual machine that it's basically distributed everywhere, in some sense, like Bitcoin. Uh, but it's Turing complete. That's very important. You can do whatever you want. Uh, so we can do arithmetic strings and so on. And there is a like JavaScript language that you can use to compile your programs. And then you have to publish them on the blockchain so that people can use them. Uh, and I think they are, they are using LLVM right now to do that. So programs in Ethereum are usually called contracts. And you have to pay think about Bitcoin again, to execute your programs or actually to publish them. Uh, it's not very much, okay? Uh, and contracts can access and modify the, the state on the blockchain. So think about it as a big database and you have programs that are executed independently of even the authors and modify the state. The programs cannot be changed when, when they are deployed. In some sense, they are virtually distributed. Uh, so pretty cool stuff. This is the implementation of Bitcoin in Ethereum. Okay, this is like Bitcoin in Ethereum. Uh, what we see here is a balance mapping, and I call it Debcoin. Uh, and for every, the, the creator of the contract has a lot of debt coins at the beginning, and then you can execute within this program. Everybody can send, execute the code, paying a bit of ether to make transfers between people and doing transfers of debt coins. So this is this is basically the what we have right now with Bitcoin in I don't know, 20 lines of code. There's another contract that I made. Uh, it's a program that you can bet your ether. So you can send money to the, this contract, and it will flip a coin, and it will give you two times more or zero. So basically, it gives you zero all the time, well, on average, right? Uh, so you can do that kind of stuff. And you cannot control it. OK. Uh, OK, so what I want to do with that? Uh, I want to model the Debian democracy with Ethereum. I want to implement our interactions with it, so this is this is just a template. 
I want to map people and packages that they can upload and uh, the, the, the new member process and so on as an exercise to actually know how Ethereum works. So this is what I said, basically. I want to re-implement De Debian with Ethereum. So I did some basic research recently to do that, and I implemented some basic stuff like adding, adding DTS and so on. There is no voting and st that stuff that may be a bit complicated, but I, but I uh, welcome you to help me with that. Uh, we could package Ethereum as well. That may be a bit difficult because it's moving very fast. Uh, and so if you are interested, please contact me. I have some Ether. I can give it to you so you can play with it. And uh, uh, we can do something together. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. The next person is Yvonne Oluoc with... Um, Universal Operating Software, how to get all demographics represented. Oh. Hello, Hi. everyone. Just a second. Just a moment. Okay, Please stand by while we equip, while we equip so, the speaker. Yeah, so we get my presentation. Yeah. Yes, I nailed it. All right, do I get it from my machine or I just put my machine is over there? Okay, um, we'll, actually, we'll actually take this out of order for the moment. Um, Adrian? So next up for just a moment is Adrian Gebelal Lopez talking about Rescutux, which is, rescue ta which is a rescue task based Debian live CD. You ready? In just a moment. Oh. What? Oh, clip the, clip the, uh, I don't know. Clip the thing to the belt. Sorry for the long years. Um, uh, okay, hi. welcome, Adrian. Okay, uh, th thank you uh, for coming here. I'm going to talk about Rescatax, so let's go. Uh, what is uh, Rescatax? Uh, Rescatax, in the first place, it's a Debian Live CD, so it uses the Debian Live technology. Uh, its main purpose is uh, rescue. So that means that when your computer does not boot, it helps you so that it boots again. Uh, and it has uh, not also a Linux user target, I mean the, the, the users that are going to use the Rescatax Live CD, not only are Linux users, but, all, but also Windows users. And uh, its main um, property is that, that its tasks Based. I mean, uh, most the other rescue CDs on the uh, open source world uh, give you the tools, and you have to know to now how to use these tools. With Rescatax, you just uh, launch a task, and it does it for you. So, on the new Linux features section, we have uh, this is uh, some examples. We have restore group and also restore uh, group uh, version two. Um, we can change the general Linux password 
so that uh, we, when forget it, we can change it for another one. Or when the the old sysadmin leaves the the company, we can set it a new one. Uh, if we are not very good at uh, messing uh, messing with Sudor's file, we can also regenerate it so that it works, and then we we can re-edit it. And uh, we can do a file system check, uh, FSCK. Uh, for the Windows people, we can clear Windows passwords so that you don't need a password to enter into Windows. Then you can set up within Windows a, a new one. You can also uh, promote a user so that it, it is a, an administrator, an, administ an admin. You can also unlock a Windows user because sometimes the, uh, the account expires. And you can also restore the Windows MBR so that uh, if, if, you don't, if you are not using group, you can boot with uh, uh, Sys Linux actually. And uh, some, just some extra features. Um, Here's there's there's a screenshot that uh, shows a greet uh, a hacked greeter from Tails, you know the diagnostics the uh, CD, uh, where you can choose a language and a keyword so that uh, the live CD works with your language uh, 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 ready. So it also to the text architecture at boot. And it also has uh, lootback.cfg support, and we are looking for what for integrating it back to Damian Life itself. So, I wanted to present Rescatax, just in case some of you in the Debian world did not know about it, and also because uh, we need help on rewriting and testing it for Jesse. Uh, write the documentation. It's like every other project. We need documentation uh, to get new features, ideas. Goes a minute. Yeah. Uh, it's also very important to test and, fi and to find uh, new books because uh, depending on the book that uh, it happens, the, your computer may, may is, is screw. And also the. It will be nice to have UFI support for Demian Life, which I think it, it is not currently implemented. So that's it. You have plenty of videos in YouTube uh, in order to find how Rescatoc works and uh, how easy it is to use it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, next up is Richie Hartmann with how to use Git to manage your digital life. And here he comes. Thank you. So um, most of you will probably have used Git at some point in your life, uh, but you probably mostly use it for code uh, to check out, to, to, oh, to distribute code or whatever. Um, thing is, um, it's useful for a lot more than just using it for, for plain source code. Uh, there are examples, for example, if you want to uh, do configuration management, um, some people just think of pushing things out, Puppet, SaltSec, what have you, but um, if you want to have backups, revision backups of your, of your configuration, uh, it would make sense to, to not have this in a large, huge backup file, just have one distinct repository with all the changes which you can then track all of a sudden. Uh, and blame it, it on people or whatever. So, um, for example, you could use ETC Keeper for this. Um, there is also the possibility to use it f to manage your blog um, and just have it at the, at the background of your blogging engine. Uh, IkiWiki would be an example for this. And then there's my, my main motivation for standing here <laughs> uh, to actually manage your own configuration, your own home. Uh, basically to just um, manage all of your digital life in your home user or in your user home with Git. Um, there would be two tools for this, WCSH to manage all your user configuration and Git Annex to basically uh, manage everything else which allows you to um, maintain information about files in Git 
and synchronize this across arbitrary hosts and have arbitrary subsets, subsets of files, but uh, you don't have to check in all the data into Git. So, um, but it still takes care of, of tracking this where it is and just copying it back and forth uh, by rules which you can define. Um, all of this is pretty quick. Um, there will be a BOF tomorrow at 15.30 in room Amsterdam, which is in building A. Um, where you're more than welcome to join and either tell us how you are using Git for non-code purposes or on the other hand, just learn how others are doing it and basically exchange ideas. You let me know? Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, okay. Any, s no, no, no questions at this point. So, um, just as a quick example of, of what you, oh no, there's one more tool, uh, MR which um, you probably want to use if you have more than one repository, uh, that's all of you. Um, basically, it takes out the pain out of managing your repositories. If you, say, have 20 repositories from one project and then you have a few for work, you have a few for your configurations, whatever, um, keeping all of those up to date is a kind of pain in the ass. If you have one single tool to just keep track of all of those repositories and then update them on when you want to or just push out new information to your repository upstreams when you need to, um, all of a sudden this becomes one single command and even five minutes of Wi-Fi at the local airport will just be enough to get everything synchronized down and, uh, and upwards again. Okay, thank you. Again, 15.30 tomorrow, Amsterdam. I think that gives Richie the land speed record. He's still got, um, he's actually still got nearly two minutes left, but <laughs> never mind. Um, long anticipated, now um, we have Yvonne Oluwatch speaking about universal operating software, how to get all demographics represented. Hello. Hi, my, my name is Yvonne. I'm from Kenya and I thought I'd do this talk because I'm sure most of you are wondering. Uh, I'm new. Uh, this is my first DevCov to attend and I got to learn about DenCov last year. I uh, was in a Women in Tech conference where women, women technologists were gotten from Africa and were brought for a conference here in, here in Germany. And uh, I met a Debian contributor from there who, who said I'd fit in well in this group. I don't know what criteria she used, but then that's how I found myself. So this year when there was a Twitchy program, I tried contributing in documentation, but then I was told documentation had been phased out. There's no longer that. Then I tried, um, uh, I was told maybe I can try to maintain Debian which I'm, I'm working, it's a working progress. Like today in the morning, I was so happy to learn. Uh, I was being taught how to use BTS, which is very nice. And I found it's very simple and doable. So I thought I'd give a talk on how to increase more diversity in Debian because this is the first diversity uh, section that you guys have created and I am very honored to be here to represent uh, Africa as a whole. And also, specifically with diversity, I'd like to put more focus in women, more women African being represented in Debian. We have a very good uh, number of women technologists in Kenya who are doing well in open source, and um, if we can get more of that into this community, I think it would be great. So, women developers in Kenya. Mm. If, uh, if you've been in Africa, and especially Kenya, you'll know iHub, iHub.com, I'm a member there. And uh, statistically speaking, we are like 15% uh, of women technologists there who are web developers, mobile developers, and um, doing other things in tech. Uh, and to get more women participation, I was looking at the structure under which Debian operates. It's volunteerism. So like you get uh, free hours out of your normal day job and you get to add something in Debian. Uh, if you look into the Kenyan context, uh, personally I feel that's a long shot because for, for someone to like uh, get two hours a day to contribute uh, faster, just the cultural setup that you have back home I think might not fit well, but with time I'm sure it will fit if we get the right target audience. Then also, how do you tap into the developers community? So my suggestion was that if we are to get more women developers uh, into Debian, I'd really appreciate if we can do partnership with uh, an organization for women in tech in Kenya known as Akira Chicks. 
It uh, targets young women who are either studying computer science or computer engineering, and then we train them into so we train them into programming, teaching them various software programming languages. And uh, I'm part of Akira Chicks, and from there is where I came up with an initiative known as CATS, which stands for Socially Keen Individuals Redefining Technology Spaces. And uh, we do create, we do meetups once a month, or as frequent as possible with availability of resources, and we ensure that we build the technology uh, community for women in the Kenyan society. So if we can do the same with Debian, because bef uh, before we do the long shot of someone having time to spend two hours or one hour on their own, we need to, uh, personally feel we need to do more meetups, get more people encouraged so that without that, they know they feel uh, compelled, even when they're on their own, to do some contribution in Debian. Then uh, with that also, that one goes hand in hand with how to maintain women in this community, so regular meetups. Then also mentor mentee program physically, besides the one you guys, uh, the, besides the one Debian already has online, because uh, when I tried contributing uh, during our treaty, you are to be you are to be connected. You being a mentee and you have a mentor who guides you through that. So I would also appreciate as much as we have that online, you can also do the physical mentor mentee program. And also I looked into the Debian Wiki for Debcom for 2016 or Debcom 16. And he, you guys had already talked about this, organizing remote Debian conferences to attract more people, which is a good step, and I support that. So uh, Debian is a volunteer community, uh, which is working well to continue creating more support for force. And I know it just needs dedication and determination for people to contribute to this. So I hope materials available and resources can help grow that and attract more. And I hope to see more African women in Debcom 16. Thank you. Thank you very much. One more, one more speaker, Sunavurla, talking about QML. Okay. Okay. So, am I loud and clear? Yes. Great. So, this is a five-minute edition of the talk that I'm going to do on Monday at two in here. So, hang on. Uh, this is about uh, QML, how to write uh, fancy GUI application in the, in the modern world, and uh, we have this simple application. It's a rectangle that has a size, and we can run it. Simple. So, let's make it a bit, bit, bit more complex. We could uh, say, let's, put, let's make it, it red, and uh, ta-da, all live. And uh, we could continue saying we want another rectangle, and we want it to say, we want it to bind, bind it so that it, uh, fits in half of the red rectangle. Uh, this is basically anchoring things to each other, saying uh, that this inner rectangle is going to have top and bottom matching the parent rectangle. And uh, the right is the the same uh, parent that right, and finally anchors left is parent horizontal center. So now we have a red square and a w white square covering half of it. So let's try to say uh, maybe we want a bit of text in the middle. And um, we have a text saying DebConf. And um, here we have a text placed in the middle. 
Next, let's do a bit of, uh, of mouse interaction. Uh, what about saying a mouse area? And let, let's just let, let it fill the wide, wide rectangle. And when clicked, let's do some magic. No, with the white one, because it is it is uh, it is uh, a a child of the the white one. So now we have a white rectangle, and if I click it, uh, we get a debug output saying clicked. But that's not not fancy enough f for this. So let's extend it and saying let's give this text an ID, saying let's call it text field. And when clicked, uh, so let's say text field dot rotation equal, uh, plus equals 180. So we have now, when we're clicking it, it is basically being rotated, but uh, we can get it even more fancy. Um, say, so let's say whenever the rotation changes, of the text field behavior on rotation. Let's just do a number, a number animation, and uh, we should just seeing it actually flip nice and and smoothly. Okay, and. Uh, um, this is more or less the basics of uh, of all the f of where we'll start uh, on Monday. So um, everybody, show up on Monday in here at around two, I think. But details in the, in the schedule. Have fun. Okay. Thank you very much.